laugh. Not like you drive it anywhere, is it? Yeah, what do you mean? Not too often, but. Trailer for every Academy Award winning movie ever. How many are there? Oh, this is 14 years old. Ghost. Establishing me. Is that Lex? A toast. Establishing me as the wealthy, successful protagonist. Why don't you apply the same mentality you have for renting versus a mortgage on transportation? Why don't you apply the same mentality you have for renting versus mortgage on transportation? I, I think I do? What? Oh, leasing? Why the f would you lease? Oh, I see. Um, oh, man. It's the comparison is so bad. I have to think of like how to explain how bad the comparison is. When you lease a car, what you're doing is, is you are buying, you're essentially buying the depreciation of a vehicle so that you can have the fun of driving a new vehicle. That's what you do when you're leasing, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's just, that's what you're doing. Um, to compare leasing to renting would be the same as saying, imagine every time a new, a brand new apartment complex opened and you leased it for the first year and then the rents went down after that, but you immediately got kicked out of the apartment. Or maybe you had the option to stay, I guess, because some leases give you the option to buy. But that's like the difference between um, leasing and buying or, or leasing an apartment and like leasing or buying a car or renting an apartment, I guess. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's just, yeah, it's not really, it, it, in order to make that comparable, you'd have to rent only brand new apartment buildings that were overpriced and then, yeah. Here's a stupid thought. Is there any tax trick that you can do with the LLC that your LLC leases the car? Um, if I wanted to, I could put the, I don't know if you could put a car in, a, in the name of a business, but I could buy it with a business account um, to make it a business expense. But the, um, but there, but you, there's no good, there's no valid reason for the IRS to, to have me buying a car for a business. I would be using it basically exclusively for personal use. Um, so if the IRS were to audit me and then go through my expenditures and then try to say like, oh, I see you bought a car for your business. Do you use this car for your business? <laughs> well, not really. You, it's my personal vehicle. Like it would be, yeah, not good. So it's a tax write off. Like you would, it's probably not allowed. Handsome. Yeah. Remember the green hair? Uh, maybe it's like talking to people. Yeah. Friendly concern that something may be missing from your life. Confidence that nothing is missing in my life. Interrupted statement of reassurance that my good fortune will not waver. Introduction of characters suffering from the most topical disability of the present year. Said retard is now under your custody. My catchphrase! Frustration with these new circumstances. Admiration at your seeming selflessness. Interest in your bold rejection of social norms as evidenced by your dyed hair. My name. My name. Guys, please. Relief. I was a big proponent of leasing, then interest rates went up and it no longer made sense, so I bought a new car last year. It's just about what makes sense for you. If you're leasing a car, it's because you want to drive a new car. I don't know why you wouldn't. I don't like. I don't think there's like a a cost intelligent way to lease. Leasing is just a thing you do if you want like new car experience. No. At having found meaning in my life. Friendly concern that a string of heightened and seemingly unrelated plots may now arise. Dude. Differences are surfacing between us. Accusations about your sexuality. Suspicion that a character once thought trustworthy may not be trustworthy. Also, I've got to use tough love to help this Latin American Wait. teenager. What? He's just having fun. Let him live life. Is he running into your room a lot? He's just so noisy. What's wrong with him making... 
making noise. It's a cat. That's what they do. If you wanted a quiet animal, get a gerbil. Believe in himself. Also, I must prove innocent this incredibly humble human male. Also, I've decided to fight with the Native American metaphor against the American military metaphor. Naive yet inspiring statement. <coughs> and then the music gets hopeful. Specific. <laughs> what are you doing to him? Oh my god, this dude's like parkouring around the fucking house. Big outlining of your major. character flaws overreaction <laughs> friendly black optimistic advice passionately whisper repetition this scene doesn't make it to the final cut of the movie <clears throat> inspiring final lines of a What are you in here for? Manic depressive. You're not like other blacks. You're a real charmer, huh? You seem to have taken quite an interest in Rachel. You want to, uh, bust out of here and escape? Are you still one of the Brotherhood? Um, no, I think they're going to revoke my membership. I used to be a white supremacist, then Rachel taught me how to love instead of hate. Love is not a race. Neo Ned. Starring Ethan Suplain, Sally Kirkland, Gabrielle Union, and Jeremy Renner. <laughs> Wait, was this, was this real? <laughs> if you mostly do mutual funds for investing, would you do an international fund or focus solely on the S&P 500 and total stock market? Um, there's some stupid fuck fund that somebody recommended once and I started buying into it as well. I think it's called VT. Am I making that up? Which is like international stocks. I guess if you want to be internationally diversified. But listen, if the U.S. markets go down, the whole world's going down. So who the fuck cares? Speaking of, hold on. <sighs> Ooh, okay, our CrowdStrike is finally stabilized and is on the up. NVIDIA is still on the up, but not as up as it was a week ago. We believe in these two stocks, though. The guy that recommended that was a huge meme in the Bastiat community, and he no longer recommends Vanguard World. Oh, Vanguard Total World Stock ETF. Well, I'm still holding on it. If I had me money to invest right now, though, I would invest in Intel. But I am over leveraged on meme, on meme buys right now. I used to lease cars after having two that became money pits, ultimately broke even on the amount spent, assuming car three wouldn't have been the same. Um, I mean, it's important when you go to, like maintenance for a car is very important. Some maintenance is very important um, because if you don't 
do certain types of maintenance, you're looking at huge repairs down the line. Um, once cars have hit, it's really going to depend on the vehicle, but like once a car has hit certain mileage limits, doing major repairs just doesn't make any sense anymore. But I mean, you kind of have to know the vehicle and you have to know the vehicle history to know if it's worth it or not. Like if you're doing major repairs on a car that has like 250,000 miles on it and it's like not known as being a brand or a vehicle that lasts for a long time, like you're going to run into other problems. At that point, it's probably better to just buy a car for, but you can buy a used car for the same amount of money. You'll be putting into like huge repairs and yeah, just, but it depends on the, um, yeah, it depends on. Do you ever just give up in your debates with people and then try to give them advice on how to make it as a streamer? I'm surprised you didn't just tell Jesse he'll be gone in a year if he doesn't change his approach. Why? I mean, why? What? I'm not here to give career advice. Also, that'd be really presumptuous of me to give career advice. Also, um, yeah, I realized because I didn't have time because I had to do that show last night that I didn't have time to run through everything I wanted to with him, but yeah. Is it true that EVs, especially Tesla, save you a lot in maintenance and repairs? No clue. Never heard that before. Not sure if it's true or not. How believable does this look to you? Do you say your thoughts on the lawyer talk to? I don't know. The only thing that's iffy is, um, but also I'm looking like really hard at this. The only thing that's iffy is when she turns her head back to the camera. I don't know why it seems a little weird when her face comes back that I don't know what's going on there, but I, if I just saw this, I'd probably just assume it's real. Felt like Jesse was just avoiding engaging with any of the points you were making that might change his view. How would you have approached this combo moving forward if you had more time? Uh, we would have ran through the entire elector's plot because I like you can link. We can look at every single document, especially because especially because technically I had already won the debate um, because he 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 had immediately said that if that thing that I was alleging happened actually happened, that would obviously be really bad. Um, keep in mind too that if you can prove. The elector's plot, which is like easy, if you can show that, it speaks a lot to the January 6th insurrection intent as well. Because if you're already showing somebody moving so illegitimately in one manner, so badly in one way, and then there's another event running in parallel, it, it makes that other event look really bad. So, yeah. Don't you get bored of running through the same stuff with dipshits again and again? Bro, I played StarCraft professionally for like five years. <laughs> Why would I get bored of doing the same thing over and over again? Do you know how long we played League of Legends? Harvard. The guy giving people a load of money which they had to spend really fast. Mm. All right. But then uh, presumably a, a load of money that you spend really fast, you buy a house. That house is still going to increase in value, you're still going to have wealth tied up in assets. It's a terrible way in which people acquire assets, though, because logically speaking, what they should do when they retire is sell their house, cash in, yep. um, and downsize. Mm. If people did that, the problem wouldn't really be there. Mm. Ooh, I don't know if the problem would go away entirely, but he's hinting at something that me and Econo Boy came in, or was it somebody else came in to talk about, that... um. You're, you're not very well incentivized to um, adjust your housing based upon your needs. If you have a house, you kind of want to keep it. Like, I don't know how common it is. I wonder if there are numbers on that. Like, how many parents sell their home after their kids move out? Like, you'll buy a home for your children because you want to have a home with, like, bedrooms or kids. But then once your kids grow up, you don't really move out. You don't, like, sell it and move. You just, like, keep it and you're there. And it's like, wait, 
um, <laughs> what's the point of this? Now you're like occupying a whole ass house that you don't need, um, that you don't need for, uh, yeah. Um, I wonder how common that happens. They don't. I, I don't understand, I mean, literally, okay, I know of people where you have a single person, a widow, living in a house worth 2.2 million, whose own children are having trouble replacing the shock, shock absorbers of their car. Mm -hmm. Before the woman's husband died, the two of them went down to the harvester at the end of the road, okay, discovered that the special offer on the, at the, the cheap dinner before 6 p.m. didn't apply on Fridays and walked all the way home again. Right? Now, I don't know when, you know, I don't know what your idea of millionaire is, okay? Mm -hmm. But probably your, mm -hmm. your definition of millionaire is not someone who goes to Lidl because they're worried about the price of lemons. Right. But I know people who have literally... So you have this absurd discrepancy where you have people who are asset risk rich in a form of an asset which is completely illiquid, where for what... Illiquid is what he's saying, right? Risk rich in a form of an asset which is completely illiquid. Yeah. Where for whatever reasons, and some of them are good reasons, I, I, I'm not disputing this, but older people seem absurdly reluctant to downsize. I, have, I don't quite know what's going on there, okay? I've talked to my parents about this, who are, I love them both, but are just financially just lost to this world. Um, and it's like, yeah, I think they live in like a four-bedroom house right now. I was like, why? Well, what if the family wants to visit? We get a hotel <laughs> or we sleep on the couch. Why would you have an empty room 290 days of the year for like, if that's assuming you've got two months worth of family visit, like it's for all my things. We've got all these objects now and we have, to, we need space for them. Sell them. My God. Okay. But I mean, my brother lives in a house somewhere in Buckinghamshire where um, effectively the entire road, not quite the entire road. I think the entire road bar three houses consists of a house worth a million quid in which one or two retired people live with four or five bedrooms. I think my aunt's uh, they're, house... They're effectively bed... My aunt lives in a huge house. Oh, fuck. Can I find... Hold on. Do I know the address to this? Fuck. Um... I don't remember it. I wish I could look up the square footage. She lives alone. <laughs> My cop, the cop aunt, yeah. She has a um, full full retirement from the New York City Police Department, and she works full-time at Home Depot so that she can afford her stupid, huge fucking house. I have no idea why. What the fuck is the point? What the fuck is the point of retiring? Just to work for it. God, dude, bo boomers just, and Gen Xers are just, Um, fuck, what is the city? Is it this? All right, never mind. Blockers for the property market. Okay, they're preventing people from forming families. Those people, they don't need... Just talk to her about it. The, the answers that I gave you earlier, those were real answers that my parents have given before. This is why they want, like, they need a house for all the things they've got in their life, and because they're they're older now and they deserve to live in a really nice place. And like, it's just like, I've just never understood it. For me, like, money means that I never have to worry about missing a bill, and I have the freedom to do whatever I want. Not that I'm like sinking a ton of money to some huge fucking stupid fucking house. I can understand if you have like a nice view somewhere or at least like places you could go walk to or do things, but not just to live in some big ass, the fuck, who cares? Who, maybe it's just me, I don't know. Why, why, who cares? You have a big house. The fuck is the point?
In some cases, people hold onto their houses for sentimental value. Yeah, but then you're like destroying the whole fucking world by doing that. Like, is that a good, is that like, what if I wanted to just burn piles of coal and trash because we did it growing up for sentimental value? Like, what, a, that just, I don't know. I mean, if you want to like destroy the world, I guess. Did you move a lot when you were a kid? Maybe that's why you don't have a home feel. No, I mean, I had a home feel for my first home. It was super sad when we got foreclosed on and kicked out of our house uh, and had our car repoed. Uh, I felt that. Now, I don't know if it was because of all the horrible stuff happening around our finances. Which, by the way, if I ever in my entire life, if I ever wanted confirmation that you guys are brain broken on all these issues, it was arguing with that one dude for 30 minutes, having all of chat tell me that I was out of touch and didn't understand anything about housing. And then as soon as I brought up that example that that guy was saying was impossible, all of chat immediately switched to, oh, he's too emotionally involved. That's why he can't see this issue clearly. That was the funniest 180 I've ever seen chat do on a perspective that I've had in my entire fucking life. Okay, so <laughs> how does keeping a house that you like equal ruining the world? If you are one or two people and you have a three or four bedroom house, you're, you're engaged in the overconsumption of housing. You are in that house. Houses are limited. Um, it's a scarce resource because you can only build so many houses and there's only so much land. And now a family that might want to buy a house can't do it because you're living there and occupying it and keeping it off the market for nothing. It's wasted space for you. But you just like it because you have memories in there. And now, so now you're just destroying the market. Um, yeah. property market okay they're preventing people from forming families those people they don't need the space it's kind of wacko serious question is there any good reason for the irs not to fill out tax forms automatically if they have all the data they need to do so nope americans are just retarded when it comes to trusting the government to do anything just like there wasn't really a good reason to oppose net neutrality <laughs> uh it's just republicans and conservatives are wacky and crazy mm. now they're they're effectively bed blockers for the property market okay they're preventing people from forming families those people, they don't. That's the dumbest take I ever heard, Dustin. Don't you own a house with your ex that's being wasted? They live there. <laughs> no? Need the space. It's kind of wacko, okay? I don't quite get what's going on. Now, one thing, you do, one thing that could solve the problem quite quickly is to engineer a pretty decent property crash just temporarily so people no longer had this absurd overconfidence in the fact that their house would continue to go up. Mm. I think there are people who don't move out of London who would be happier living out of London, but they're terrified they that once you move out. out, you'll never be able to miss, move back in, and they're terrified of missing out. It's, it, it's, it's basically a massive collective FOMO. Yep. Mm. Okay. Now... I mentioned the fact that, you know, neoliberal economics um, assume... Why wouldn't they live in an apartment? Because what, you can afford a house? <laughs> Why would they live in an apartment? What? ...optimal uh, utility-maximizing expenditure. Just to be clear on this, okay, housing is the worst way you can spend your money in terms of the externalities, okay? If I go and go to the pub... God damn, who is this guy? Rory Sutherland. Hello, hell yeah. Hey, I chatted with you before about something similar. I'm listening to your recent lawyer conversation. I think you're not approaching it in a rhetorically effective way. I have notes and timestamps. Got a second to chat. Um, maybe. Yeah, give me 20 minutes. Is there anything wrong with overconsuming housing? People overconsume a lot of products in capitalist countries. That's what makes them great, right? No. Uh, housing is an incredibly limited resource. So overconsumption of housing is a huge issue. And that's not good. <laughs> um, we probably have to be careful about how we consume stuff related to housing. Um, certain things that are like very scarce or very limited, um, where the demand is relatively inelastic, like where lots of people need them, is probably not good to have people massively overconsuming those things because the externalities, uh, the other effects you're having on the market are not good. For money in terms of the externalities, okay? If I go and go to the pub, right? Okay, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of, if you look at the effect my expenditure has, my spending money has on other people, when my partner and I are renting a three-bedroom room of extra space to build a studio slash exercise room be overconsumption, in your opinion? No, you're using the house. As long as you're using it all, that's fine. It's it's The main problem is probably old people that have their children move out, and then they don't adjust their uh, living situation. That's probably the biggest culprit. Housing is the worst way you can spend your money in terms of the externalities, okay? If I go and go to the pub... Right. Okay. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of if you look at the effect my expenditure has, my spending money has, on other people. Right. Mm. There's a huge amount of variety in that. In that, if I go to the pub, I'm not just buying myself a pint. I'm also securing the survival of a pub for the benefit of lots of other people. Yeah. Okay. Spending money in pubs, cafes, and restaurants, I would argue, is kind of positive. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's positive for the wider community. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, you might even argue, and I would, that buying a car from new is an extraordinary act of philanthropy because I buy a car, I take a massive hit in terms of depreciation so that someone significantly poorer than me can have a car that was that is nearly as good as my car was when I bought mm -hmm. it new for half the price. Mm -hmm. Okay, go out seriously. Go out and buy a six-year-old Jag. Just as a heads up, I hear this so much every time I've went car shopping. I feel like this is just not true. Maybe I'm crazy, or maybe I just don't buy the right types of cars. But it's the same thing that people used to say when it comes to um, GPUs. I remember this for a lot for like a decade. It was always like, wait till the next set of graphics cards comes out, the last set will become cheaper. They never became cheaper. That was never true. I always hear people say like, oh, cars they lose twenty percent of their value as soon as you drive off the lot. The second you're, bullshit. If you go buy used cars, where the fuck are all these used cars that are two years old and like thirty percent, forty, fifty percent off? I feel like cars are like a year old or two years old or like a, around like five to ten percent, like within the same price of being new I, I don't know maybe i just bought used cars at like the wrong time but every time i went shopping for used cars i was like where the fuck are all the 50 percent like three-year-old cars the fuck this used to be true but not anymore maybe it was a long time ago it was true but i don't i feel like it's been true for like 10 years holy shit okay you're basically driving around in a luxury vehicle at somebody else's expense i mean people who buy cars from you should be celebrated we should have actually we you know we should have a, a statue to anybody who buys a car from you it's an amazing act of philanthropy okay my brother's an academic and i always tease him by saying that i he basically in most material goods he ends up buying exactly the same shit i do just three years later mm. okay you know whether it's computers <laughs> or mobile phones or whatever you know a secondhand iphone Utter, utter extraordinary act of generosity. Someone has a phone which... There's an XKCD on this, right? Fuck. I'm not going to be able to find it. Was it, is it, is it, was it this? Oh, was it? Sorry. The IRS is rolling out direct file to all 50 states starting next year, based. Where have you been all week playing Half-Life 2? That came out in 2004. I get games on a five-year lag. That way, I never have to buy a high-end system, but I get the same steadily advancing gaming experience as people who do, and at a fraction of the price. There are no downsides. I can think of one, early 2013. Guys, the cake is a lie. This was a triumph. The cake is a lie. Lay sigh. I remember trying to log into the original Command & Conquer servers a year or two back and feeling like I was knocking on the boarded-up gates of a ghost town. Effectively, the richest person in the world probably would have owned, I mean, not this mm -hmm. very same mm -hmm. phone, but an identical phone, three years before, and they get it three years later for a third of the price. From the little you know about them, if Nikki Haley won the Republican nomination, would you still vote for Harris over her? Curious how much you dislike how far left-ish Harris is. Uh, I would probably have to do a serious policy evaluation. Um, I, don't, I don't even know where the two parties stand right now on policy. The Democrats seem like they've gotten a little bit more outwardly hawkish, which I appreciate now as I've gotten older. I guess I've become more hawkish. Like, I appreciate a stringent defense of Ukraine. Um, I appreciate uh, restraining of, but is still a support of, um, Israel. I appreciate wanting America to be somebody on the world stage. Like, these are things I appreciate now. The Democratic Party seems to enjoy that, um, enjoy the support of that. So I'm okay with that. Uh, econ policy, I'm not as crazy about. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just depends. I, I would have to do, like, a serious policy back and forth analysis. Biden killed TurboTax. Why don't we hear about it? The IRA includes a provision for a system for filing taxes directly to the IRS for free. It was piloted in 2024 and will be made nationwide in 2025. Biden killed TurboTax. Killed it? Phone, but an identical phone three years before, and they get it three years. Overconsumption of housing is a term used by people who don't understand the importance community. You mean the importance of community? Um, don't even start. Please don't even start. Please. I can already see through how fucking insanely fucking white you are. It is the whitest and most American privilege brand idea in the world that you need a huge fucking house for community shit. 
Uh, not to lean in too heavily on anecdote, because I know that you guys get mad when I cite data and you get mad when I cite anecdote. Uh, my whole white family have so many big houses uh, that with all these rooms and all the space and they have no community, no family visits. Nobody's got the money to travel. Nobody does shit. The bar the biggest like community I've ever seen happen in my family was when I would go down to Hylia uh, and hang out with my Cuban family uh, during the summer. And those motherfuckers lived in the shitty cockroach infested apartments and every fucking night Somebody would be having a cookout or a barbecue and people would be outside and chatting and talking. This myth, whatever you're saying, actually, hold on, I'm sorry. I'm not even mad at you personally. This is just like a pleading life advice thing. Please do not delude yourself or bullshit yourself into thinking the only way you can have fun in a, in a, in a community family environment is to waste your life slaving over the acquisition of some huge house. It is the wrongest, dumbest, stupidest fucking thing ever. Plenty of people have fun in small areas and in, in, in apartments, outside, in part, whatever the fuck. You can have fun in so many different areas. Have community experience in so many different areas. You need some fucking huge house to do it is so wrong oh my god i've seen my um god i've watched so much of my family slave away to get these huge houses with this delusional idea that they would be having family dinners like every other night and nobody goes and visits or anything because they're all broke they're all over leveraged or working on paying off their chapter 11s or you know working on moving between houses because they're getting fork like they're, they're all just financial and financial ruins i think he's talking about having to move out of your community if you were to sell your house Oh, fuck neighbors. <laughs> Who cares? That's just wrong because your neighbors suck. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean that might that could be I could that could be an understandable reason to say stay. I guess I could understand it, but people always say if you don't want noisy neighbors in an apartment complex, then you should get a house. Maybe I think. Um, <laughs> okay, I admit that this is a biased take. But you should make as much noise in your apartment all the time, every time, okay? Because, listen, when I worked, I worked night shift. And you day walkers have zero respect. Day walkers have zero respect for people working graveyard. It's like we it's like our sleep schedules don't exist to you. The amount of times, even at my work, the amount of times I would get called in early, like why are you call like I have to be at work at 10 p.m. Why are you calling me at four? Asking if I can come in at eight. I get off work at six. Can you imagine if I called the day shift manager that's supposed to be there at six and will be ready to work at 637 because day shift workers are always the laziest fucking employees ever. Can you imagine if I called her at midnight to see if she could come in at four? You would kill me if I were to ever make these phone calls, okay? So you know what? If you're in an apartment, make noise. Fuck your neighbors. And then go and fuck your neighbors because they should be fucking themselves because day walkers have no respect for grave shifts. So fuck noise complaints. Make all the noise you want, motherfuckers. Later for a third of the price. Mm. There are lots of ways in which consumption is actually extreme. You've got even if I go and buy a hot tub, okay, which is getting onto the more selfish phase of things. Um, if lots of people buy hot tubs, hot tubs will become a lot cheaper and more people will be able to afford hot tubs. Yeah. If you okay, so this is this is my problem. I feel that I've worked in advertising for 30 years and I've entirely wasted my time because what I've done is help people buy better and better and cheaper and cheaper consumer goods for the most part. There are problems in customer service in, in, in service-led brands, which I'll, I'll park for the sake of I think I think customer service has got worse, by the way, through a kind of cult of automation. But, mm -hmm. but basically, the manufactured goods you Wait, a kind of cult are part for this part. There are problems in customer service in 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 service led brands, oh. which I'll I'll part for the sake. I think I think customer service has got worse by the way through a kind of cult of automation. There is but, it's not even customer service. It's like fucking, it's like robot service. Yeah, true. We just gave up on that completely. I don't know who to blame on that. I feel like Steam was one of the first big companies. But I, I don't know if they influence Google or whatever. But yeah, yeah, there are there is no more human customer service anywhere. But mm -hmm. but basically, the manufactured goods you buy, the meals, the food you buy, the meals you eat out, okay, are better than they were. I mean, you're not even old enough to fully appreciate it. But trust me, compared to the 1970s, okay, you, P Pizza Express is the Manuel Cat Saison compared. Okay, compared to you know a standard place you go and eat in 1973. Mm. Everything's got better. It's mostly got cheaper and more affordable. Okay, and the subtotal of that effect has been to allow people to spend more of their discretionary income on property. 
uh, and therefore most of the what should have been the extraordinary gains in living standards in terms of the holidays people enjoy, the cars people drive and everything else has been soaked up effectively by the property market. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we should tax that because I think it's, a, it's an entirely worthless form of wealth accumulation. And I think that, that land value, not if you improve your house, you get to keep that because that's your work. But the actual basic value of the land and the appreciation of the value of the land should be heavily taxed because it's an atrocious thing for people to do with their money. It's not an investment. Okay, It's totally inert in terms of its effect. It's purely rivalrous. It, it's, it's much worse than the Dutch tulip thing, the property market. Damn, okay, this guy goes harder than I do. Jesus. Because I don't have to buy a tulip, right? Okay, the Dutch tulip boom was an insane kind of Ponzi scheme nutter boom. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are substitutions for tulips. I know these tulips are getting a bit expensive. I think I'll, I'll move the, into, what is the Dutch oh, tulip? Oh, right. It was a thing that... It's part true, part mythical, I think, if you uh -huh. dig into it. Um, it was effectively the tulip prices, um, and particularly for rare tulips, basically spiralled out of control at some point in 17th century Holland. Mm. And so it was one of these cases where effectively... Um, rising prices brought in ever more demand. And so you had this thing where effectively it was a crazy boom which spiraled out of control. But the great, you know, the, that's, not, that's not a problem because I, I, I don't need a tulip. Mm -hmm. I can get by without them. I could decide to substitute with gladioli, okay? But you need housing. You need a place to live. And actually, you need a place to live with a reasonable degree of certainty in which you can bring up a family. Um, the fact that housing has become the predominant uh, form of wealth storage is a huge problem. Is not good. Adam Smith, okay? Adam Smith distinguished between three things. Labor, capital, land. Subsequent economists, because it made the maths easier, conflated labor and land, sorry, conflated capital and land and treated them as the same thing. Adam Smith quite rightly spotted that they are not the same thing. Capital and land are not the same thing. Land is something that is in short supply, and in many cases, the value of it is determined by the actions of others. You know, oh so boy, he's, going, he's about to go full Georgism. Someone builds a road, yeah. suddenly your house is worth either less or more, depending on the road, is, whether the road is yeah. framed as a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Um, the Singaporean government basically is Georgist. In other words, they own a lot of the land. They fund a large part of the government. By, they're effectively property developers with a side gig in government. I think that's the third or fourth time you said Georgist now. Can you? Oh, um, okay. Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, so Henry George, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, by the way, you could apply the same principle to any, any non-renewable resource, whether it be land or fossil fuels. But George's idea was that, I mean, taken to its purest extreme, was that there should only be a single tax in the United States. What are your thoughts on people buying land to preserve nature? Uh, nature's important. I think it's important to do stuff like that. Central Park is like, it's nice and amazing that in the middle of New York City, you've got like a nice, I think that's, I think it's a good thing. And the tax should be on the value of land because the, the, the idea being that the value of land is basically, uh, land ownership is basically extractive. It's rent seeking. Now here's the greatest mystery in economics. All economists agree that rent seeking is a bad thing. In other words, patent, you know, patent trolling would be another example, okay? You're not actually contributing to anything. What you're seeking to do is to own a bottleneck, all right? and then effectively own something that is essential to somebody else and basically milk your ownership of it. You're not actually doing any useful work. Yep. You're not investing and creating anything new. You're simply exploiting an, you know, an asset that other people require access to. Yep. So what tends to happen, okay, what's, what, what George would say is... Rent-seeking behavior is... Um, I wish I had a more concise explanation of this. Rent-seeking behavior is when you're finding ways to make money by just like exploiting a current situation, but you're not providing any additional value whatsoever. Um, so... Things like derivative markets wouldn't be rent seeking because you can argue that there's like a boost in liquidity or things like um, being a tour guide would be rent seeking. Rent seeking is like when you're purely exploiting a situation to just like imagine there's like a river, I guess, and you would go in front of it and you would just like hold up a gun and say you have to pay five dollars here to come and drink. That's like rent seeking behavior. There's got to be a better way to let's what is the more concise explanation? Isn't the gig economy the same? Absolutely not. That's a service that's being offered. Rent-seeking is the act of growing one's existing wealth by manipulating the social or political environment without creating new wealth. Rent-seeking activities have negative effects on the rest of society. They result in reduced economic efficiency uh, through misallocation of resources, stifled competition, reduced wealth creation. Law oh, rent-seeking can also be in the form of like going to the government and like trying to find ways to milk money out of the government without actually doing anything. Um, are scalpers, would scalpers be considered rent-seeking? Maybe? I'm not actually sure about that. I don't know. Um, the result is reduced economic misallocation resources, stable competition, reduced wealth creation, lost government revenue, high income inequality, risk growing corruption. Which is scalping, rent seeking. Aren't you pro scalping? Um, I'm like neutral on scalping. I think that, um, I don't think you should ever, I think generally it's stupid to be mad at scalpers. Don't improve. Profit from buying the available stock and raising the price you pay. Rent is also lobbying action. Corporations engage in. Rent 
rent seeking is collecting wealth without creating new wealth. If it's buy something all on, on all they offer in resale is a higher price than the other benefit that is rent seeking. If they were to offer something else, like a convenience or bundling or some other service that's no longer rent seeking because the wealth was earned by selling. I feel like if you're just scalping in and of itself, I think this would probably be considered rent seeking behavior. The um the issue with um the the problem with scalping um true yeah dark figment yeah <sighs> fuck I don't want to get into all my unpopular takes because I'm just right and people get mad as fuck about it there if scalping is happening the reason why the scalping is happening is because the initial price was set too low that's why people get mad but that's it the price for the initial thing should have been set higher. If you're mad at the scalper, you shouldn't be mad at the scalper. You should just acknowledge that either you probably shouldn't have been able to afford the good or service in the first place, or they should have made more of them. Uh, when PS5s are listed uh, for you know 300 bucks each, and they sell out almost immediately, and they're relisted for $700 on some websites, and people are buying them, the original PS5s should have just been listed for five or $600. That's it. Scalpers are only existing uh, in a profitable manner when markets for some reason are setting prices inefficiently. And if there's a, an incredibly inefficient setting of a price, then a scalper is going to come in and they're going to adjust the pricing levels and they're going to collect rents basically in, in doing so. But what about supply side issues? Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, like you can supply, I mean, you can supply, um, if you don't have enough supply, then you should you should raise the price. But for um, I think for uh, PR reasons, like companies can't do that because they would look bad. But then scalpers will come in and they'll make money. But that will always happen. There's almost nothing that you can do to counter that because the market is just setting a price that's just way 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 too low. What if scalpers cause the supply shortage? It shouldn't, that shouldn't technically be possible. Um, if we're talking about elastic goods, but. Matthew Iglesias, what is this? Oh. oh, true. Okay. Asset that other people require access to. Yeah. So what tends to happen, okay, what's, what, what George would say is that when you get people, let's say, forming a community, and the community becomes more and more desirable and more and more wealthier and more people want to move there and so forth. Um, the gains, which should go to the people who did the work or indeed provided the upfront investment to build the buildings or whatever, instead go to the owner of the land who contributed nothing. Mm. And what tends to happen is whenever you have any source of, whenever you have any form of useful activity which depends for its performance on its location, the gains from that activity do not primarily go to the person who's performing the useful activity. Okay? They go to the person who owns the land on which that activity takes place. Yes. Okay, so you know an example would be airport retail, mm. which is effectively you know uh, various brands have to be there. You, the, the people who get rich out of airport retail are not retailers; they're airports. Mm -hmm. um, and what they happen to do is simply own a kind of you know they've got a, a, um, a location, the ownership of which confers an income on them without requiring any commensurate investment or risk. And so the idea is that effectively, since this thing is extractive, some people have described Georgianism as basically socialism in relation to land, uh, free market capitalism in relation to everything else. Yeah. Okay, that's probably quite a good, right. that's quite a good shorthand. You could, interestingly, I'm sure some people do, I haven't researched this enough, extend exactly the same thing to... Yeah, ignoring the factor of bots on shoes, consoles, GPUs is just nutty. They couldn't significantly scalp at the current level without bots circumventing cart limits on retailers. The reason why those limits are being put in place is because the price is not set appropriately. If somebody is able to massively buy up a good and then relist it at a higher price, that means that... The original, the original good should have just been listed at a higher price. If people that are scalping can make a lot of money, the reason why they can make a lot of money is because the initial price was probably too low. Like that's, I mean, there are going to be some circumstances for this where, like, if you're if you're literally able to buy up one hundred percent of a good and relist it, and, and like it's something that people really want or whatever, then there's, but, for example, non-renewable energy. Yeah, you could say oil. 
the, the, the ethical justification for this is kind of, look, land, okay, the fruits of your labors rightly belong to you because you created that thing, okay? Mm -hmm. However, land shouldn't necessarily belong to anybody because it was effectively an endowment from the creator, mm -hmm. you might have said, and the gains from that endowment deserve to be a portion. How much do you think the PS5 should have been priced at release? I mean, ideally, the ideal pricing is where the every single unit is sold and the last unit sells for the like most expensive price somebody would be willing to pay for it and then like the whoever like the goal would be to to get as much money out of every customer as possible and for every customer who's able to buy one who can bid the most for it to um to be able to buy it but that but that's not what people <laughs> people don't like to hear that people want to think that everyone should be able to buy a even a limited thing like there are 1000 ps5s available and all 10000 people should be able to buy one like that's what people want to hear so but because it was effectively an endowment from the creator, you mm -hmm. might have said, and the gains from that endowment deserve to be apportioned fairly and reasonably, whereas the gains from individual labor, enterprise, or risk deserve to be disproportionately um, uh, apportioned to rewarding the person who underwent those efforts or those risks. Mm. I think that makes sense, does it? Yeah. So it's basically saying that land is a different category of thing. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you might argue of fossil fuels. I, 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 would, right. I, I would say it's not a huge leap to say that you should basically tax the use of non-renewable resources. Yeah. Because the idea being that they aren't actually the fruit of man, if you want to get religious about mm -hmm. it, they're actually a kind of, you know, that they're a fixed endowment. Um, and the What about when bands in the 90s refused to sell tickets above a certain price because they didn't want to play for only a wealthy audience? I mean, I don't, wealthy people are going to get it anyway. What do you mean? There's no way that you can ever then. I mean, poor people are just going to sell their tickets. Or you're just, okay, so what? So somebody who's able to re spam F5 on the website and, and buy first is more worthy than a person that has more money than somebody like, well, who, like... I'm sorry, but like, what do you mean? It's just, um, like, yeah, the problem is just, a, uh, it sounds mean, but like, it's, this is just like a, it's an entitlement problem. People think that they are owed or they deserve some particular thing for no real reason. You don't like. Why couldn't we just create a type of patent system for selling PlayStations that only PlayStation has and not allow reselling? I mean, you can try it, but like how the fuck, like regulating that throughout an entire economy is just going to be really, 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 really difficult. You're trying to deal with, uh, you're creating a market inefficiency and then you're trying to solve it with government policy. You can do it. I mean, it's not like arguably all government policy is trying to redirect market forces, but market forces are real. Market forces are powerful. Like, um, What about the under unforeseen shortages, like if a major warehouse burned down, causing supply to be unexpectedly short? Should businesses then raise their prices as a consequence since their stock is now more valuable? I think that in a perfect world, they could. But in the real world, you can't really do that because so like, for instance, like here's what would happen in a, in a perfectly economically fluid world. When Sony does the first run of PS5s, the first run of them is sold at like $850 each or something, right? Um, and then people that want to buy it that are wealthier will come and buy it. Um, and then people that, you know, can't afford it, wait for the next run. And then they buy the second, you know, the second supply. But the problem is in the real world we live in, it's a bit messier and people are more um, like you, you, they're emotion. I don't want to say emotionally driven, but like it's a different you, you live in the real world where perceptions and stuff exist. And if you initially list a PS5 at $850 and then you do the next run at 500, people are going to have that first impression. It's going to be really bad and it might hurt your reputation as a business to do the initial listing at a higher price. But again, Anytime you have a huge difference in what you're listing something as what people are willing to pay uh, versus what people what you're charging, like you're gonna you're gonna there's gonna be arbitrage. I, I, I like I don't know. It's always gonna happen. Scalping is just arbitrage, really, and, and arbitrage is real and powerful, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say. You'll never ever 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 be able to. Um, you'll never be able to fix. You'll never be able to fix that. Um, okay. Comments. Um, but you don't think real estate companies and foreigners buying out houses is a problem? A real estate company buying a house to rent it is not a problem. The supply is still available in the market. I don't think foreigners buy out houses and not, and don't occupy them. I don't think that happens. Um, overconsuming would have multiple, would be having multiple houses, not having a bigger house. I mean, you could overconsume in both ways. It just depends. If you rent out a house, it's not really overconsuming. You're, it's, you're making it available in the market for somebody to live in. Uh,
Uh, Destiny, don't they typically give their house to their children so their children can have a house for their family? No? I don't think the ages work out that way. Maybe your grandparents could, but like, is mom and dad dying? Or is mom and dad ready to leave the house once you have kids? <laughs> I mean, maybe if your parents are really, really, really old or if they're willing to move out and leave. But then also, who do they give the house to? What if your parents have two sets of kids um, or one set of kids? I guess a set would be two kids. That guy's talking about your parents' second house. Are stock buybacks considered rent-seeking? No, of course not. Would payment processing charges, percentage-based, be rent-seeking? No, because you're paying for a service for a payment processor, right? How many rooms does your apartment have? That's a two-bedroom apartment. How would you solve a dilemma of an in-demand performer that only wants to offer services to a certain demographic independent of wealth without violating EO or legal ethical constraints? I don't think you can do that in the United States. If you're trying to target a protected class, I don't know if you're allowed to do that, right? Why does the accusation of entitlement only apply to people who want lower prices, but not wealthy customers who can buy up something at any price? Well, because if you can afford something, then I, then most people, at least in a capitalist economy, say that you would be entitled to it. If you can buy something, then you you would be able to buy it, right? Isn't that how that works? I mean, you could argue there are some things that you shouldn't be entitled to via, like, money. So, for instance, like, uh, let's say that you can afford to go to a certain college. It doesn't necessarily mean you're entitled to a diploma or entitled to a good grade. You'd have to earn that in other ways. But if we're talking about consumer goods, you are entitled to those by buying them, right? How is creating a guest suite not a valid adjustment? If you rent out a room in your house, I think that's fine. It just sucks that there's like all that space that's just empty and unused. Can you really solve this overconsumption? Is the only solution any way to build more houses? Can't really change people's minds radically and make them let go of their beloved houses? I mean, I think the culture has to change, but in the US, I, I don't know if it can at this point. Uh, what are the best floors with no noise in apartments? I don't know, probably... Um, Level one floors? Corner rooms are good too because you don't, I think you're usually farther away from people to scream. Like if you're in a corner unit, I don't think the people on the sides of you hear as much. Maybe, I don't know why. <sighs> Should wealthier people be entitled to scarce organs if we allow a market for organs? I don't think that's how we do organs. We don't price them out. Don't we put you on a wait list for it? How is raising prices of scarce goods utility maximizing? This would only be true if everyone's incomes were equal and the only access for bidding was utility conferred. I didn't say it was utility maximizing. I'm just saying that if you're a company and your goal is to make money, which is what every company's goal should be, then ideally you would want to sell every good for what somebody's willing to pay for it, right? If you think people having extra rooms is so bad, then people who own multiple homes must be way worse, right? Not if they rent them out. I mean, if they have multiple homes and they're just sitting on them doing nothing, yeah, I think that's probably pretty bad. What about scalping medicine? Uh, I think you can probably make ethical arguments for why, that's why I was saying before, uh, elastic goods means things that you can go without. Um, for certain inelastic things, you can probably make moral arguments for why there shouldn't be price scalping um, on these things. Like for instance, like hoarding during natural disasters is a form of like sc scalping, like price gouging or stuff like that. You could probably make moral arguments why that shouldn't be allowed. Russian billionaires own empty homes for value. I don't believe that. I think there are way better investments to make than just having an empty fucking house. True, but if someone just wants a big space and they afforded that space by contributing to society, then isn't amoral to consume more space than they need just because housing is inelastic. I mean, you're just, you're fucking the market up a little bit. I mean, if you want to, it's like polluting, basically. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you said if you live in a place that has more rooms and people living, it's a waste. But I doubt you live yourself, always live in only one or two room apartments. Well, you would be wrong. I 
And I'm the worst example to use if you're trying to do a personal attack there because I super do not give a fuck about... <laughs> I don't, I've never been a person who like, needs a ton of space. Why should companies only try to make money? Isn't one of the classic arguments for markets is that they align incentives. Jacking up in scarce goods skews this more towards the seller. I'm so sorry. I'm trying not to get mad at you, but you're not entitled to a PS5, dog. You'll live if you don't have one. You're not entitled to the latest NVIDIA 4090. That's not a scarce good that's going to cause you to die if you don't buy one immediately, okay? You're, you, you don't have to have every single brand new Android, every single brand new iPhone, every single brand new console, monitor, graphics card, uh, whatever the fuck. You, you'll live if some of these are priced higher, okay? You don't have to be able to afford every single top of the line brand new gizmo and gadget that comes out or else like you have to, you know, make arguments like you you can't afford insulin. It's not the same thing. I like I'm sorry. Is the desire for lowered prices ever justified or should we always lean towards a 100% buyer's market? What? What? Is the desire for lowered prices ever justified? It depends on who you are. If you're the consumer, you always want the lowest price. If, you, if you're the um, supplier, you always want the highest price. but you aren't entitled to a low price, I assume. No one's entitled to any, pr I mean, the only types of entitlements we should talk about are like moral things, like medicine and stuff. People, hopefully in society, we could make people uh, like be able to have access to medicine and stuff. <laughs> like, or, or, you know, like being able to have a place to live and not be homeless or be able to afford food and clothes and stuff. Houston's with you, Butch, go ahead. Uh, There's a strange noise coming through the speaker. And I didn't know if you could connect into the Starliner and let me uh, keep mic and let you hear. I don't, I don't know what, what's making it, but... Aren't you against universal health care? Not, no, not really. 